My first job was at Western Auto. It was just a sea of typists, ladies doing typing, typing, typing. And, you know, the break came for, for lunch and stuff, and I said, hi. They just gave me nasty looks. Nobody spoke to me. And I thought, God, what did I, what did I do to these people? So three days later, the boss calls me in, and he says, gee, I'm sorry, Carmen, we're going to have to let you go. And I said, why? Didn't I do the job good? And he said, no, 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 you did the job great. But he said, since you came to work here three days ago, all these women, they've never seen anybody like you. And then he said, the boys on the dock, their work is in half because they're too busy trying to flirt with you. And he says, you know what? You need to get into show business. they wanted me to be Miss Chicago and I said no and they said why not I said what I'm gonna go enter some contest I'm gonna lose to some ugly fart and then I'm gonna ruin my confidence all my life everybody said to me oh look at those eyes she's so gorgeous As a kid, uh, going to school was the most awful experience of my whole life. In Chicago? Life. Yeah. Every day, all the girls would chase me down the street trying to beat me up. And as a matter of fact, one time they threw a brick and hit my mother in the head. Not only are the girls picking on me, and I'm known as the biggest whore in school. Never been kissed. <laughs> Never had a date. <laughs> <laughs> never would let boys near me because I thought, well, if I don't let any boys near me, they won't talk about me. This black girl, Azilla, she said, I think you need a bodyguard. I was about 10. She said, I'll be your bodyguard. And I said, oh, okay. So the whole crowd, and it was always the little one in front. The little one was always in front with the crowd of girls, you know, to come beat me up. So here's Azilla. She's like about six feet tall already. And she sticks her butt out, you know, like kind of like a Zulu stance, and boy, they ran. They ran. So now they send us to juvenile home, yeah, for ditching. Here we were in there for two weeks with murderers, drug addicts, prostitutes, and here we are in there for ditching. Eleven? I wasn't quite eleven. I was ten and a half. Azella was thirteen. In the meantime, someone tells this one girl that I called her a nigger, which I didn't. So God knows where she got a razor blade. But anyway, she comes up. I was drinking at the drinking fountain. And she grabbed a hold of my hair and went ch -ch 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 -ch, like this. And all of a sudden, I feel it's warm. And I look, it's all blood. Of course, there's no mares in the place, right? I'm going, so the warden comes and she goes, oh! And so, yeah, they take me to the infirmary. She had sliced up my whole face. Thank God it wasn't deep. Stayed about two or three weeks in school. I couldn't stand it, so started ditching again. Got called up before a judge, and he said, well, we're going to send you away till you're 21. So my mother said, well, now what? And I said, I don't know. She said, we're going to have to leave town. And you think you're so smart, you want to support me? I said, sure. I'll do it. So because, I mean, nobody knew I was 11 years old. My God, I looked 20. So uh, in the meantime... I supported her until the day she died. Uh, she was 86. First time I went to Vegas, I was not quite 13. And I got fired. And that's when I met Diane. Diane and I went to Vegas. We were hired by the Sands. And Diane I, Ladd? Yeah. And I made the mistake of telling this girl, how old I really was, and she told on me. I was emceeing Lou Walters' Latin Quarter Review at the Riviera in Vegas, 
and I was finally old enough, I was 18, uh, some talent scouts, uh, no, actually Sidney Skolsky saw me. And uh, Walter Winchell had our, our, already was a fan of mine. And so he and Walter Winchell were going, I discovered her. Skolsky said, no, I discovered her. And I said, oh, who cares who discovered her? <laughs> and in the meantime, uh, Skolsky told his agent to come and see me at the Riviera. And he was a real good-looking guy, Jim Maloney. And he came backstage and he said, you should be in the movies. And I said, yeah, and so should you. <laughs> when Elvis asked me out in Vegas, you know, I, ten times I didn't go. He came backstage with his entourage and the whole bit. And I would have gone if he had said, would you like to meet me in the lounge? Instead, he said, I'll meet you in the lounge after the show. And he's saying, oh, I think you're so wonderful in the show. He said, I'll meet you in the lounge after the show. And I said, sorry, I'm busy. I was 20 when MGM put me under contract in uh, 1957, uh, December I think it was. You know, I was 10 years too late. Because MGM hired me to dance and sing. And I never danced another step and I never sang another note. Well, Flyboy's got to win for a lot of reasons. Sam, you said afterwards. So I changed my mind. It's got a right to know. Well, maybe, but... A right to know what? What is this? Take it easy, kid. Take it easy, I'll tell you. Tomorrow's my last race. As of tomorrow night, I'm ex-jockey Sam Barry. So that's the big secret, huh? How come you knew first? Well, there's one other thing. Uh, one other reason, really, why I'm quitting. I'm, uh, getting married. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think that's great. No, really, great. I, I was worried about you being lonely away from the track. But with two of you... Well, who's the girl? Do I know her? Yeah, you know her. Well, what's the matter? Come on, who is she? Me. Sorry, kid, really sorry. We didn't mean for it to happen. Look, I've gone over this thing in my mind a dozen times, how to tell you... It just wouldn't have worked, Ronnie. Honestly, it wouldn't have. Shut up, shut up, shut up! Well, you don't have to get so upset. Uh, Warren was not my type. Not my type. Well, because Warren dated everybody in the world, you know. And I certainly wasn't going to be one of his uh, victims. So uh, I was with a date, and Warren came by, and my date had just gone into the men's room. And he said, Carmen, I said, oh, hi, Warren, how are you? And he said, fine. He said, I want your phone number, and I'm not leaving this time until I get it. And I said, oh, come on, Warren, you know, whatever, whatever. And I wouldn't give him the phone number. He said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a scene. And here comes the date out of the bathroom. And so I remembered this friend of mine was always saying, oh, I think Warren Beatty is so great, you know, so I gave him her phone number. About two months later, he finally got my phone number, and he called me and he said, you've got a lot of nerve doing something like that to me, and blah, 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 you know, whatever. And he said, what's your address? I'm coming right over. And I said, I'm not telling. At a midnight film preview, Frank Sinatra heads a list of celebrities. But as far as Frank goes, uh... No, Frank was a nice guy, and I didn't want to date him. I wasn't going to be uh, somebody. I'm not anybody you could boss around, you know. And uh, I knew that we'd be instant enemies. And so rather than make an enemy out of him, I, I never dated him. And about 20 years later, I finally made a date with him and, uh, uh, to go to dinner. 
and his makeup man kept calling me saying he'll be an hour late, a half hour late, another hour. And so finally I said to Beans, his makeup man, I said, listen, tell Frank let's make it another day because I was already at 8.30, then 9.30, then 10.30. Now it was almost going to be 11 o'clock. And I said, I'm tired, you know. It's like, we'll make it another time. So Beans said, okay, I'll tell him. So then Frank comes on the phone. I mean, called me. What, now you're breaking the date? And I said, Frank, it's almost 11 o'clock. I've been sitting here since 8.30. I'm exhausted. And he says, oh, you're breaking the date. And I said, well, I guess if that's the way you want to put it, yes, I'm breaking the date. And he hung up. I wore that thing on my head in Easy Rider, hoping nobody would recognize me. I was embarrassed after I saw all those hippies. Me and the cameraman were the only two sober people. They were all drugged out, lying on the ground, going, um, um, I said. I said to Dennis Hopper, I said, what do you want me for? What is this? And he said, oh, Carmen, you're this mine, and you've come to do the hippies out of their food and their money. I said, now who's going to believe this? I think I was coming from a party in the valley. Just as I started to get out of the car, a hand comes over my mouth. Don't move or I'll kill you. And he yanks me out of the car, and I could taste blood. I know my lip was bleeding. And just a split second, he let go just for a second. I said, you fucking asshole piece of shit. How dare you scare me like that? I thought you were the cops. And he was so shocked. So what is your problem, asshole? I talked like the biggest bull dyke that ever hit the road. Anyway, his picture appeared in the newspaper and on TV, and he murdered eight nurses, and his name was Richard Specht. And he murdered these nurses one by one, if you can imagine. He took them down the hall and murdered each one by one. Can you imagine? He looked just like Nick Cage. Exactly, but of course Nick Cage wasn't around in those days. But if he was a Nick Cage, <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time I was sexually harassed, I think it's ridiculous these people that are suing. So what if they whistle when you go by? That's what men should do. As opposed to, <laughs> you know, hitting you with their powder. Well, that's what happened with Lou Walters. When I went in for the job, he tried to kiss me. I mean, he was Lou Walters, the impresario. He only had one eye. Mm -hmm. He said, would you be interested? And I said, yeah. I said, except do I have to kiss you? <laughs> you know. And he said, no, no, no. So anyway, you know, we ended up being friends. So then years later, he whispered in my ear one night, you were the only 